Hey, everybody, and welcome to Life is a Gamble. I am very pleased today that my guest is the legendary gambler, Billy Baxter. Over the last 13 years, I've done over 600 episodes of Gambling with an Edge. And when people ask me, who are your favorite guests, top of my list has always been Billy Baxter, uh, just because he can't, he knows how to tell a story and he's had a fascinating life. Also, I just want to say that all professional gamblers owe him a huge debt because he is the one who fought the case with the IRS, Baxter versus the United States, allowing gambling as a profession. And the court ruled in Baxter's favor that gambling earnings could be considered earned income. And because otherwise professional gambling would be a nightmare tax-wise. I mean, it's already kind of a nightmare, but you know what I mean. So uh, Billy is now 83, and last year he was inducted into the Sports Betting Hall of Fame and an amazing accomplishment in the World Series of Poker uh, senior event out of almost 8,200 entries, he came in second. And, and, you know, just because it's a senior event, these are not uh, uh, doddering old, old men. I mean, there are a lot of really strong players that were in this event. And for him to come in second, he is a seven-time World Series of Poker bracelet winner, and that would have been his eighth. Uh, but anyway, an amazing accomplishment at 83 because these uh, World Series of Poker events are really uh, – a lot of it is endurance. So uh, kudos to Billy for that. Anyway, uh, now here's the show. Billy, I, I'm so happy you're here and we can talk. Well, it's good to be here. How are you doing? Good, good, real well. So I want to talk about uh, golf and about boxing. But before we get to that, I just recently learned that you were actually on a chain gang. And for our younger audience who doesn't know what a chain gang is, would you explain what that means? Well, I, I don't know if this is one of my best stories, but I'll tell it anyway, being as you ask. Uh, back in my early day before I ever came to Las Vegas, this is prior to 1975, uh, I actually had a little gambling casino in Georgia, which was very uh, illegal. We had craps, roulette, blackjack, just like Las Vegas. And we were open all night, every night. And it was very much against the law also. But at any rate, the during... This is any of the stories I tell you all verifiable. You can get your 1984 issue of Sports Illustrated. The front cover, I think, has Alan Trammell on the front issue. It's May of 1984, and there's a 10-page story in there that will tell you about the FBI and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation knocking the door down of my casino, which was during the Masters Golf Tournament. This is in Augusta, Georgia, and... Famous football player Cerny Jurgensen had the craps in his hand when the door when the doors came down. But anyway, uh, out of that, I wound up getting a year in jail, and I was able to run that concurrently with several federal bookmaking cases that I had at the time. And the government they just wanted a conviction, so they allowed me to run the uh, the state case with the federal case, so I was able to do the time in my hometown in the prison there. And this is, was on a road called Tobacco Road in Augusta, Georgia. And in those days, they had a chain gang, just like they do, or you see in the movies from years ago, they had the, the, the prisoners where their feet were tied to the to, together, and they had a one, one guard at the front with a shotgun and one guard at the back with a shotgun. And the truck was loaded with the hound dogs, ready to chase anybody that got away. Well, when I first went to prison, that was where I was headed. But the good news about this story is I wound up not having to go out every day on the actual chain gang and do that because I had uh, 
well, I'll just say I had a little help, and <laughs> I was able to get a job in the parts department, which is where we we fixed the trucks and all that took the prisoners out to work on the chain gang. So I avoided the actual swing blade duty. Yeah. So the swing blade, you would be chopping. Yeah, you chop grass on the side of the road, picked up trash and whatever. The twenty or so prisoners that were tied together, and that went on. I mean, that's just. The way the prison system was back in those days. This is, we're not talking about a long time ago. This is in 1975 in Augusta, Georgia. It's amazing it was still going on then. Uh, yes, it was. Great movie about that for anybody who hasn't seen it. There's a great movie with Paul Newman called Cool Hand cool Luke. Cool Hand Luke, that's yeah. exactly, yeah. But, okay, so anyway, um, then I wanted to get into boxing because I understand you used to manage boxers. Is right. that right? That's correct, yes. How did that happen? Well, that was because of my gambling activity. I, I would I always bet. I like to bet on boxing. I, I, that was one of the things that I thought I did best was watching sporting events and being able to determine which team was better or, or whether it be basketball or football or whatever it was. And the same thing applied to boxing. So in order to bet successfully, in my mind, I would go to the gyms to watch people train when they were here for big fights and all that I was interested in betting on. And one day uh, I was in the in the gym and a young kid named Roger Mayweather came to town. He got threw out of the Olympics and right before the Olympic trials for a bad attitude. And he's in the gym and he's uh, beating up all these pretty good fighters that I knew about. And I said, well, who is that kid? And they said, well, that's Roger Mayweather. He just got through. He's out in town here looking for a manager. And I had never uh, did that before, so uh, I approached him after his workout and talked to him, and uh, we came to an agreement, and I became his manager. And 13 fights later, after having no am uh, no pro experience, in his 13th fight, I put him in for the world championship. He fought a guy named Sammy Serrano in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in Roberto Clemente Stadium before 40,000 fans. And... Uh, he won the world title. The guy hadn't lost a fight in 10 years. He knocked him out in the, I think it was eighth or ninth round. Wow. So that's how I got in the business. And then from there, I became Bruce Curry's manager, who went on to become the uh, welterweight champion, uh, a junior welterweight champion of the world. And my last fighter was Vernon Forrest, who fought Shane Mosley twice and uh, was our representative in the Olympic trials, and he was uh, became welterweight champion of the world. So I had three fighters. I never had a fighter lose a fight out of 75 fights, the first 75 fights they ever had, and they all three became world champion without ever losing a fight. Wow. Now, did you have to deal with people like Don King to set Don these King matches? Was, Don King was our promoter for, the, uh, for Mayweather's first title defense. I took... I went to see him because it was very difficult to get rated. Back in those days, you almost had to buy your rating and that sort of thing or have somebody push you to get in there. So I approached Don about Roger and told him that, you know, this kid is exceptional. Uh, he can beat anybody at 130 pounds. And he said, well, you really, you don't you think you need to give him a few more fights? He's only had 13 fights. I said, you get him to fight, I promise you he'll win. <laughs> and he says, well, you got a pretty good reputation, I understand, in the gambling world for picking winners and all. He says, so I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to get you this fight. All you got to do is sign this promotional agreement. <laughs> so he became our promoter. Ah, and did <laughs> did he end up screwing you? I mean, I thought that well, was his M.O. To say, uh, Don's still alive, I think, so I won't. So, actually, I like Don quite a bit, but uh, I think that him and Aaron both fall into, under the same umbrella. They were like... 1A and 1B, they were an entry. I don't think anyone was. They both had not the greatest reputations for treating the fighters that well, but they both were great promoters. So, so the controversy came with the uh, the Sugar Ray Leonard uh, Hagler fight, was it? Yeah, that was a fight that was in Vegas, and one of the fights that uh, I bet about three hundred thousand on this fight had taken like. Whatever it was, I forgot. I think it was around three to one because Leonard was uh, uh, had been off for about a year or so, and Hagler was like pretty well thought of as pretty much unbeatable at 
at middleweight, and Leonard was moving up from 47 pounds after being off about a year, year and a half, maybe longer than that. I, I just don't recall exactly. And uh, somehow with my deductions, I came up, I thought he could win this fight. So I uh, made a pretty large bet on the fight. And, uh, of course, we won a very close decision, which Bob Arum was the promoter at the time. And he knew that if Hagler lost and Leonard won, that Leonard's trainer would not let him be the promoter for the next fight. I'm kind of explaining how this uh, big story came about. And Aram at the time was writing a story for the Las Vegas Sun on Sunday. And the fight didn't get over till like nearly 11 o'clock at night. And the Sunday morning paper, which come out at like 1 or 1.30 in the morning, Somehow or another, he managed to race out of the stadium down to the sun, and my picture wound up in the paper for uh, uh, having fixed the the Hagler Leonard fight, <laughs> and uh, of course that was later through a grand jury investigation. And everything else, it was determined that I didn't have anything to do with it. But uh, I actually I should have sued Aram, but at the time I'm just not the suing type, so. I just let it go. Yeah, but and and I, it w- might have been difficult to prove it was Aram that that said it or that was. It wasn't a- too uh, too difficult, but we'll just let it go. <laughs> so, did you like the boxing business? I actually loved the boxing business. We went all over the world. I went to Japan with Bruce Curry. We fought a undefeated fighter in Japan, and uh, just to. Uh, King was our promoter with that fight. Also, Aram was my promoter with uh, Vernon Forrest. And, uh, but anyway, uh, we went to Japan, and when we got off the plane, this kid we were fighting, it, we were led to believe it would be a pretty easy fight. But when we got off the plane, the first thing we saw was his picture on the, in the uh, airport going out. They had about 30 newspaper people greet us at the airport, which was pretty unusual. And I see this kid's picture on the wall that says, Hitsitsu Akaya, which was his name, and he's on the American Express card. It says, don't leave home without it. So I said, you know, this kid must be pretty popular over here. And we wound up fighting in his college gymnasium. He was a college <laughs> student, and uh, it was uh, pretty intimidating. They turned all the heat off. It was in July, and people were actually it was so hot they were wringing the their dresses out and squeezing water out of them at the fight, just your dress that you had on. That's how hot it was. Wow. Wow. Needless to say, Bruce did come back and win that fight in about the eighth round by not fifth of, well, I'm not sure the round, but he won by knockout because he was losing every round up to there. Oh, wow. Huh. Um, why'd you, why did you end up getting out of the boxing business? Well, that's a, uh, that's the reason I got it. This is, I'll tell a quick bad beat. This is this is a real bad beat story. Uh, Vernon was 18-0 and 0 with Aram, and he's getting ready to participate with a world title fight. I'm right before that. And he was approached by some uh, black attorneys, I believe they were uh, out of, I believe they were black out of uh, Atlanta, that talked to Vernon about, uh, if he could get away from that guy that's managing you, uh, we'll give give you quite a bit of money, and you can uh, we'll do a lot of things for you that he's not doing that. So he and he's from my hometown. That's how we became. Uh, I had helped him quite a bit through the amateurs and all, and insisted that he leave, stay in the amateurs, and go to the Olympics, which he did. He beat Mosley in the Olympic trials to go to Olympics. Also, he lost in the Olympics, but. You know, he probably should have won, but he didn't. But anyway, um, so he was approached by these people. So he, being a poor kid, growing up poor, because I actually used to take groceries to the house back in, he was from my hometown. That's how I knew about it. He's from Augusta, Georgia. And they were very poor, and I helped his family out and all. So I felt like I had a really good obligation from him to stay with me because I had took him from the very beginning and insisted on him staying amateur. But then when he turned pro, he, he did come with me. So now he's 18 and 0 and he go, goes to the commission and files a grievance that he's 
we're not getting along was his excuse. And he wanted to make a change. But in fact, these people were offering him quite a bit of money to get rid of me and sign with them. So the commission here ruled in his favor. And he was, I had two more years on the contract. So in my mind, if you got a contract with two more years, they, they, oh, and the ruling was the arbitration, the ruling was there was a black arbitrator by the name of Luther Mack. And he was assigned the case, and he ruled in Vernon's favor to let him go. And he says, but I'm going to rule that Vernon should give you like $250,000. And I said, well, I don't need the money. If I've done something wrong, just let him go. I said, I got money. I said, I don't need it. The they says, oh, no, I think you should deserve something. So that just tells you how bogus the release is. In other words, if I've done something wrong, just let him go for nothing. Right. But they insisted that he give me money, which he did, which I think obviously came from the attorneys that were into. And naturally, I think he became world champion the fight after our release when he beat Shane Mosley. So I lost the fighter. and So that soured me on boxing, which leads me up to my one of the great all-time bad beat stories of all time. So now I decide I get tired of boxing. I retire from gambling and everything. I move back to Augusta, Georgia, buy a place back there on about 30 acres, and I'm going to spend time with my kids and whatever, and I'm done with boxing and every, and gambling for that matter. And then uh, I get a phone call, and it's from Floyd Mayweather Sr., who's in the federal penitentiary doing a 15-year uh, sentence for a drug kingpin charge. And he says, Billy, I'm, this is Floyd Mayweather Sr. I'm calling you about my son, Floyd Jr. He's a very good fighter. You've done such a wonderful job with my brother, Roger, and he was very happy with you all through his career. I want you to manage my son for me while I'm in the federal penitentiary. I want you to uh, take him on. Oh, my God. And I said, Floyd, I appreciate I heard he's a really good fighter, but I'm going to turn you down. I'm just, I'm out of the boxing business. I'm so disgusted with it. I'm done. Well, he only made a billion dollars, and I would have <laughs> got a third of that, which is about $330 million. So I guess you could call that a bad beat story. I guess. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. Beg me to take him. <laughs> oh, man. I wouldn't take him for free. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. Pretty good. Bad beat. Yeah, it sure is. I should get on the uh, bad beats on football, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now they have a program on that now, bad beat stories. Yeah. I'll put that up uh, with a lot of them. <laughs> 330 million. Yep. Yeah, I don't think I've heard one worse than that. But, uh, so, Augusta, you grew up uh, going to the Masters or? Never missed a round from the time I was 13 years old, even when I moved out here in 75, until the only year that I ever really legitimately ever missed was the year that I was in jail. I was close to that chain gang you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. They, they wouldn't let me go then. So, you probably bet. More money at golf than pretty much anybody. I mean, well, I'm, I, I'm talking about like not necessarily on pro golf, but on playing golf. Well, I was never a very good golfer, but I did play a lot of golf for money. I had a partner who was pretty good, Doyle Brunson. Doyle was about a 74, 75 golfer, but he he was able to match up at around 79, so he had a very good handicap for, <laughs> for gambling purposes. <laughs> And, and what what was your me? I was terrible. I shot about eighty eight, huh. but I couldn't hit the woods. So I only I would shoot my eighty eight with just irons only. I would only play with iron. I never hit anything. In fact, I couldn't any. I never hit anything beyond a four iron. I shoot eighty eight with a four iron up, and uh, so I was just very ordinary. I could putt and chip. So the way me and Doyle played, he matched up everything to where. He would play with all the clubs. I only played with a four iron off, so they always gave me a very good handicap. And we played a lot of money golf, me and Doyle. We played uh, the guys that owned the uh, uh, Royal Casino. His name was Joe Sliman. I think he's still around town. Hmm. Uh, I think he's in the real estate business now, but <clears throat> he was making a lot of money back in those days. 
We played a lot of uh, Nassau's, $50,000 Nassau, two down presses, double the back, four and 500,000. Uh, changed hands a lot of times. Me and Doyle scrambled the Las Vegas Country Club. The last match we ever played with Joe Slam and them, me and Doyle shot 60 at the Las No, I was told, I was telling that wrong. Shot 62 at the Las Vegas Country Club. Wow. Wow. Needless to say, we won about 600,000. So when, and these figures are, you were playing this high back in like the 70s. 75 to 82. And did you give up golf at that point? Or, well, or? I, that's another story if you want to just want golf Absolutely, stories. sure. Uh, one day I go to the golf course. I'm playing. A, he's a, actually the guy that won the World Series with with one chip. It's, it's called a chip and a chip, Jack Strauss. Yeah, yeah, uh, treetop. Me, me and Jack were playing golf all the time, and we matched up all the time. So we pretty much knew each other's games. And so one day they give me a game that I felt like I couldn't lose at. So – me and Doyle were in business with other things at the time. I won't get into all that. But at any rate, uh, we go to the golf. But me and Doyle always gambled against each other, even when we were together. It was like uh, <laughs> we, he was he could never bet enough on anything. So when he would bet golf matches that I wasn't involved with, that was part of my job. I had to bet against him. But anyway, <laughs> um, we go to the golf course, and they make this match, and they were giving me a, a spot that I felt like for sure I, I had the nuts, actually. And everybody starts betting. It's like, and Tony Spilotro's out of there, too, the famous gangster, and he was betting against me and uh, a, lot of, a lot of tough guys. And so if it winds up, so many people wanted to bet. I said, well, hold on, boys. Wait a minute. I got to get my napkin out. And I, so I write down, this guy had a $5,000 Nassau. That guy had a five. And then all of a sudden, Doyle, who was there for breakfast, he says, okay, you can give me a $5,000 Nassau too. So anyway, we go out to play. And the first hole, I'll get it back. And once again, this match I had to play with Woods, which was different for me. And I wasn't very good at him. So now the first bat swing – I almost whiffed the ball, and the ball, whiffle ball out to the right, went like, woo, 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 out to the right. <laughs> I almost fanned it, and I was good enough. I didn't fan ball, so I just didn't feel. I knew something was wrong. So I lose it. So we go to the second hole, and the same thing occurs. I almost whiffed whiff it again. So I says, gentlemen, there's something wrong with my clubs. So I start, I turn the cart around. There's maybe 20 golf carts following us. I go back up to the club bus with the Sahara, and I take my clubs in there to the, and Splotter, I remember his famous, he said, oh, goddamn, you get one one shot down, you start crying, something's wrong. So anyway, we go to clubhouse, and the pro takes the screw. Back in those days, you had metal balls in the weight, which was the weight in the clubs. And when he opened it up, he said, well, I got bad. He says, looks like a bunch of woodpeckers have been in your woods. He says, <laughs> they're taking the weights out of your woods. And then he checked the irons, like the nine irons were made to like a seven and the Every club was been up. So we had left our clubs overnight. So they had doctored all my clubs up overnight. So I go back out and say, well, boys, I didn't caught y'all with too many cards in your hand. Uh, y'all <laughs> y'all cheating. I said, y'all don't let me get some clubs. We could, So naturally, they don't want to play this match on the legit because they know that. So anyway, we won't go into all how that come down. It was big argument and everything. But at any rate, we ended that match. But now, to make a long story, so now, but one of the sidelights of this story, which I thought was very funny, I went into the clubhouse and Doyle's still in there eating breakfast. And I said, because we were like partners in business with a couple of things. I said, Doyle, let me ask you something. I says, why was you so anxious to bet on that match? Didn't you know I had the nuts? And he got kind of red in the face and he looked at me and he says, you know what, Billy says, to tell you the truth, everybody said today might be a really good day to bet. So I thought that was a classic statement. <laughs> Today might be a really good day to bet. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So if the res final results of that is I took my clubs, went out there, and threw them in the pond in the Sahara. <laughs> if you go out there, you might go out there and find them now. And that's been 20, 30, 40 years ago. I've never played another round of golf since. Oh, really? Wow. That, that was, was it? my last golf match. Wow. So back in the day, did you play at all with uh, Jimmy Shagra? Because I know he had some legend. Listen, ridiculous Jimmy Shagra, I was the main spot. That's 
part of my poker history. When Chagra came to town, he was playing in the poker game with me, Doyle, Sarge, Bobby Baldwin. It was probably the biggest poker game they ever had in Las Vegas. We were playing 500, Annie, 1,000, two blinds, no limit, deuce to the seven in the 70s. And anyway, Chagra was losing a million a day on the golf course. And I was one of the ones out there betting against him. Normal day was 30, 40, 50,000 a day. He, was, he lost millions. But he was trying to line. He wasn't trying to line the money. He was just trying to act like a gambler because he knew he was under a, a federal indictment in Texas for the, for uh, he was a drug on a drug kingpin charge. And so his solution of the problem was he had the the judge who was called Maximum John Woods. He was known for killing uh, for sentencing drug dealers to big sentences. He had Woody Harrelson, the movie star's daddy shoot the federal judge dead on his front porch. I don't know if you know that part of the story. Yeah, but, I, and but, he's still in prison, right? Well, he, he probably, yeah. Uh, they let Jimmy out a month or two before he, he had terminal cancer. They let him out, and he died within a month of being released from prison. Yeah, yeah. No, I meant his, uh, uh, Woody Harrelson's dad, I think, is still in prison. Um, but I might be... Well, you don't <laughs> ever get out from killing a federal judge. Yeah, yeah. That's like, That's... I mean, a lot of people don't know it, but at that time, this was the second biggest federal investigation there's ever been in this country. Was the They had 200 special agents of the FBI that were sent to Las Vegas, Nevada, to investigate the killing of, of John Woods, the federal judge. The biggest investigation ever was the Kennedy assassination, and the killing of John Wood, the federal judge, was the second visit. And that's when they had so much heat in Las Vegas on all gamma. That's when they broke up the skim at the Sahara, I mean, at the uh, Stardust, Stardust Hotel. And all. That's when all that came down, when the 200 special agents were here. Wow. Yeah. And and another uh, sort of legendary uh, guy <laughs> blowing off money at golf was Jay Sarno. Did you, uh, who built well, Circus Circus? I wasn't a part of that, but you, you're 100% right. They had a crew around the uh, Las Vegas Country Club that played with him every day, and Bad as he was, they didn't have to do this, but I think they had a foursome that no matter who he drew as a partner that day, the other three were all partners. So <laughs> I don't think he had much of a chance. You know, I remember when I, I first moved to town in uh, 77, and, uh, you know, I was a kid, and and uh, I went to the – there was a backgammon club at the time. I went to the backgammon club, and the first time I walk in there, I see Puggy Pearson playing somebody. And who, for me, was like a legend at that time because I'd only read about, you know, these people. And uh, one of the guys at the backgammon club tells me that Puggy has just won $200,000 that day playing golf uh, with Jay Sarno. And uh, the next week he was playing seven stud, five ten limit because <laughs> um, he had blown off all the money. So I, I, it just sort of boggled my mind that that uh, guy was, you know, I, I had no clue what, you know, what <laughs> what really went on when I first moved here. But um, what do you think the biggest gamble you ever took in your life was? And I, I don't necessarily mean about money. I just mean the biggest gamble of your life. You ever thought about that? You know, I, I, I always like to think that I was somewhat of a manager as a gambler. In other words, I tried to keep my gambling in check to my bankroll. In other words, and I think that's one of the keys to success. So I made a lot of big bets in my life, but many big bets. But I always tried, like the, the Leonard fight, betting 300000 I was a big bet. And I had numerous bets of that nature in my life. But... I always tried to, I always felt one thing about gambling is your money is like your toolbox. In other words, when you don't have any tools to work with, you're out of business. So I always felt like uh, the key to gambling success was being able to, I call it answering the bell every day. In other words, you got to be able to get up and start gambling every day. That means you have to keep money. So I never after my early years when I was very young, I never put myself in position of uh, going broke again. Yeah. But you I, know, on, on one bet, like right, you, like you right. described. But, but I mean uh, gambles that were not about money, like gambles in your life. 
where you well, where, I did many things that were very unsuccessful. I mean, <laughs> we uh, bought into Doyle's room, poker room, which uh, I invested. I think it was four hundred thousand. And uh, Doyle called me one day. This is another bad beat story, actually. I went, no, oh, I might be the bad beat king with this. And <laughs> Doyle, Doyle, I invested, and we were doing very good. And this was before the Black Friday or whatever it was. About six months before that happened, Doyle called me one day and says, well, this big, big sports company out of England, I believe it was, just offered him $200 million to buy us out. And, uh, of course, my part of that, would I think I had 4% or whatever it was, was like whatever that is, I say, $8, eight million, million. Yeah. And, uh, which was not the end of the world. But anyway, he uh, – he, I said, well, it sounds like a good time to sell it. And we don't. He said, are you kidding? We're going to get a billion dollars for this company. <laughs> Needless to say, three months later, the doors came down. Everybody got closed up. And naturally, we got nothing. <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know, uh, listening, uh, Doyle's Room was an online poker site. And then all those got shut down uh, at some point. So, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you know, this has been great, Billy. Uh, any any other stories come to mind that uh, before we before we wrap it up? No, I think that's that will give you a little something to to digest and all, <laughs> and uh, you know, maybe some other. Oh, I have a lot of stories, but uh, maybe some other time I'll, I'll when you have another topic, I'll give you a few more. Okay, yeah, because I I can't get enough. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for doing this. So thanks. Just a couple of end notes for everybody. Billy Baxter mentioned Jack Treetop Strauss and the chip in a chair. And I thought for uh, anyone who doesn't know that story, what he's talking about there. So uh, Jack Strauss was called Treetop because he was six foot six. And in 1982 at the World Series of Poker, he shoved all his chips in the pot and was eliminated, or so he thought. But then what happened was when he stood up, he found that he still had a chip that had been under his napkin. And in today's World Series, um, that he would not keep that chip. He would be eliminated. But in 1982, he sat back down with one single chip and ended up winning the World Series of Poker. And uh, from that, he said, in this game, all you need is a chip and a chair to win. So anyway, that's today's show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. You can always reach me at lifeisagamblepod at gmail.com, or you can find me on Twitter at rwm21. Until next time. <laughs>